Facebook web page of the Unitarian Church. Okay. And I think we did it last week, we did the week before, and this one was also. It is on. I just am not holding it close enough. Yeah, okay. Uh, so these lectures are being live broadcast at, on the Facebook page of the Unitarian Church. And next week's also will be there. Also, the first four lectures are already up on the YouTube channel, which you can reach from the Read the Lecture Series web page, which I described last time how you get to it, right? You either the simplest way would be to do a Google search saying Winter Lecture Series Lincoln, Nebraska, that would bring you to the main page for this series. On that page, you'd find a link to YouTube channel. And if you click that link, you, that will bring you to the four previous talks that have already been uploaded. So if you missed any of those, you have a chance to get to them. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions at all about not being able to find this information, just catch me after the, after the event is finished and I'll be able to help you. Okay. All right, I think we are ready to start with our question and answer. Uh, excuse me, let me just uh, stand there and we are ready for the first question. Thank you. How do the North Koreans portray An Jung Gun? Uh, I can answer that um, because I know that they uh, produced a film in which he appears as a great hero of the Korean people. You know, I mean, the assassination took place long before the division in North and South, so both uh, both states can can claim him. And uh, you know, Kim Jong Il fancied himself a, a world-class director. So um, I'm not sure what his involvement was with that film, but yeah, they see him as a real hero, for sure. What's the, uh, what's the end game with North Korea? Oh, uh, <laughs> could, could, could you give me a, a more difficult question? <laughs> that seems far too easy. Um, the, the end game with North Korea. Ooh, um, uh, I, I'm feeling optimistic, <laughs> you, you got me on a good night. Um, so I don't think the, the answer to that is a you know, nuclear holocaust that brings us all <laughs> to a, a, a meltdown, um, he said jokingly. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I worry about those things, but um, I don't know um, if, if I can see a kind of resolution moving forward, I think that actually um, a real open dialogue about the kinds of memory politics issues I was, I've been talking about is a big part of it. So for example, like right now, the, the, the stories I mentioned with the um, Supreme Court's decision allowing Korean citizens to sue Japanese companies for compensation, um, some of the issues over the, the comfort women, these issues are bubbling up again. And even though there's a lot of angst um, about these issues, I think that's a good thing. I think that those kinds, I mean, th whatever the resolution of the, the case with, the, with Mitsubishi and Sumitomo, I think that's going to um, uh, hopefully down the line move forward to a more sort of um, open dialogue about the past. And that's, I think that's a, a key. Um, I was talking to one gentleman uh, earlier about um, how to deal with the, North, the northern regime. And I think um, Christopher Hill probably spoke about this with much more you know, knowledge and direct involvement in the process than, than I ever could. Um, but I think that we need to go back to the diplomatic process that we had been on in the early part of the 21st century. Um, coordination among all of the parties. Uh, uh, can, no one can back down on indicating their commitment to the sanctions program that was the key to bringing Kim Jong-un to the table in 2017, brought them to the Winter Olympics and so on. So I think that um, continuing to uh, honor the diplomatic process, 
continuing to put pressure on the North to uh, come to the table is going to be part of the answer to that. And um, if there's going to be a resolution, it's not going to be a clean one. Um, here I'm just wildly speculating, if you can indulge me in that for a second, but I don't know if um, there will ever be a truly denuclearized Korean Peninsula. I think that there's a good chance that we're just going to have to learn to sit with the discomfort that comes from a nuclearized northern regime, because I don't know what could possibly uh, incentivize them to completely give up their, their weapons program. <laughs> Reunification? Yeah, well, I, I'd like to believe that that's a possibility, but I mean, the complications surrounding that are, are huge as well. Yeah. Oof. Okay, sure. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, can you tell me why the Japanese still do not apologize for the Nanjing uh, massacre. Uh, uh, I'm very close to that. My parents mm. left the city mm. the day before mm -hmm. the bombing. I think 300,000 people were killed. I yeah. don't know how many. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why are they not apologize today? Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, I wish I could give you a really um, satisfactory answer. The truth is, so we, we hear often these um, these kinds of questions, you know, why don't the Japanese apologize? Or, or why don't they um, take responsibility or acknowledge what happened? And the, the problem is, it depends on which Japanese you're talking about. <laughs> um, there are plenty of Japanese historians and private citizens who have actually been a crucial part of doing the research to bring, for example, the Nanjing massacre to light, right? So um, Ienaga, Ienaga Saburo was one of the most prolific historians in Japan in the middle 20th century. And he went to court to fight against the Japanese government for the right to publish textbooks that actually pr prominently featured the information about the rape of Nanjing. So, there are plenty of Japanese who do apologize and express remorse and acknowledge what happened. But there are also many, like the current Prime Minister, Abe, like those who uh, try to get local school boards to adopt revisionist history textbooks that downplay or deny this history. And they undermine all of the good work that's done by the people I was just talking about who do have the kind of um, good conscience and the willingness to have these kinds of conversations. So un unfortunately, I think um, why do those revisionists, why do people like Abe, for example, deny? Um, I think it's because they see it as a, an issue that they want to leave behind that they think that it's an obstacle to their uh, priorities for the future, and they feel like they've done enough to try to express their remorse, and they just want to leave it behind. Um, and that's irresponsible. And it's never going, it, the, the longer they continue to deny it, the, the more it will come back to haunt them. I do have a second question, mm -hmm. which I don't know whether you answer or not. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan is a very aggressive country, mm -hmm. Japan. Uh, can and, be. Uh, they they are, uh, invaded China, invaded Malaysia, mm. Singapore, Australia, and uh, even inv invaded uh, the Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. so <laughs> what makes Japanese so aggressive? Uh -huh. I, I, is it, is it uh, correct to assume that, remember 2,000 years ago, Japanese are nothing but fishing village of mm. fishermen. Mm, mm, and mm. they went to China, mm. the Tang Dynasty, mm, mm. and then all the Chinese words and mm. everything. <laughs> Am I correct to assume that uh, be the Japanese are so aggressive because of the samurai uh, spirit? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. Then what, what makes them so cruel? Oh. <laughs> Um, I know that this is a, um, a common explanation for atrocities that occurred during World War II, that it was something in the Japanese 
natural national essence, you know, and and the presumption about this is the idea that the the Japanese essence is um, the the way of the samurai, you know, the samurai spirit, and that it's an inherently militaristic, violent, you know, bloody culture uh, that prioritizes, you know, unquestioning loyalty to your superiors, and uh, this is the kind of thing that we've heard told over and over again. I mean, look at Life magazine in the 1940s. Know your bloody enemy, and you know, Dr. Seuss's propaganda films, and so on. This is a very common interpretation, um, but uh, I think the easiest way to dispel that myth, and I'm sorry, but it, it's a myth, um, is to point out that um, the samurai who were, and that's a historical phenomenon, right? There were samurai warriors in Japan. They were never more than five to six percent of the Japanese population, even at the height of their power, right? Um, the vast majority of Japanese people who lived on the Japanese islands for all of recorded history were not samurai warriors and had nothing to do with the culture of samurai or the values of the samurai and so on. And even the samurai themselves, when you look at them as historical figures in the context of the times they lived in, they don't look anything like the bloodthirsty samurai whose values are supposedly on display in the rape of Nanjing, right? So that's a kind of, um, to me, uh, What's the right word for it? It's, it's completely implausible as an explanation for the kinds of things you see. Um, if I were to try to start to explain, um, well, I mean, you asked a big question about what was behind Japan's aggression in the 1930s and 40s in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, was it a kind of expression of their blood, bloodthirsty culture? That's not the first place I would start looking to answer some of those questions. I would start talking about the Great Depression, and I would talk about the effects of economic nationalism, and I would talk about uh, the many cases of um, uh, overt racism in the international community after World War I, whether it was the refusal to make a statement of racial equality part of the Charter of the League of Nations, or the 1924 Exclusion Acts that barred U uh, immigration to the United States from anybody from East Asia. Um, all of these acts that made the Japanese feel that they were completely isolated in, uh, in a very threatening position. And that's not to justify their decision to invade Manchuria in 1931, but it's to say those are the kinds of factors. Those are, and you know, that's, there we don't have this kind of ghost of the samurai and all this kind of bloodthirsty mythology ha haunting us. It's, it's understandable, if regrettable, human factors behind decision making, right? So that's, that's where I would approach a question like that. Okay, I have two questions. Oh, one's yes. to follow up to him. All right. Um, the first one is, you've mentioned the United States involvement in this area. Mm -hmm. Let's throw in Russia. Uh -huh. Of course, we also have the USSR until they fell. Yeah. The second question is, kind of follows up with his, uh -huh. is there a politic of memory between mm -hmm. North and South Korea mm. that may be an issue mm -hmm. of any sort of um, um, reunification or is going to be brought into play? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, so much to say about the involvement of the Soviet Union in East Asia. I mean, it would sort of depend on, on when, when you're, you're thinking of. Um, uh, obviously, today. Um, I mean, and I mean, is there like a, a specific coming to mind, or, or just to like bring them into the picture somehow? Yeah. Microphone? Okay, yeah, so the, the question is about sort of bringing post-Soviet Russia into the picture in terms of trying to understand um, East Asian politics today. And um, I'm trying to think of a, a snappy <laughs> illuminating comment to make. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the situation that you have there is um, it's, it's related to, 
Here's what I'll say. It's related to the problem that you have with China and Japan in East, in East Asia today, which is that you had a long established order, right, with a state that was accustomed to a certain position of power. And then for complicated reasons, the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, right? And then Russia since then has been trying to sort of, I think, um, reestablish its role in the international community. And y I mean, that's a kind of euphemistic way of talking about what Vladimir Putin has been doing um, since he really came to power in Russia. But you know, there is no doubt. I mean, if you just think geographically, um, Russia shares uh, borders with China and you know, very concerned about what's going to happen in, on the North, uh, in North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. So just as the kind of um, you know, memory games that we see China and Japan playing together uh, with uh, regards to this kind of shifting balance of power in their relationship, um, at this moment, one of the most sort of contentious issues in Japan's relationship with Russia has to do with some disputed islands way up in the north. If you know your Japanese geography, so there's Hokkaido, and then there's a, a series of islands that are even further up into the north um, that the Russians and the Japanese sort of dispute who has control over. And so, um, you know, uh, the, the Russians under Putin are trying to sort of assert their control over these islands, which are not strategically or economically valuable to them. It's about status, right, and trying to kind of jockey for position and power. Um, and the sort of complex international relations dimensions in the six-party talks are part of that too, the kind of insecurities of a once great power now trying to reestablish itself as a, as a smaller state with a pretty unhinged pseudo-dictator <laughs> in power. Um, and your, your second question was about uh, memory between North and South, yeah. And I mean, the, the memories of um, the Korean War and I'm sure um, Professor Cummings, who will be coming next week, will blow your minds with all of the things he has to say about that. And this is not my area of expertise. But, um, you know, when you look at the um, uh, stories that come out of North Korea, you know, there are many um, prisoners of war from South Korea who are taken captive and brought up into nor to the North um, before the div division is formalized, and then they end up living up there um, as a kind of uh, second-class citizen is isn't even the right word, right? There's a very sort of hierarchical society that they have, um, and they're tainted, and their descendants are tainted. Um, so there's this kind of, even within the you know, North Korean society, uh, these kinds of connections between North and South are extremely complicated. And um, yeah, so uh, that's a, we see some of the same problems there too. Yeah, thank you. Mm. He said the Korean thing is An Jung Un is a very superhero, uh, no, and yeah, then yeah. what he's doing, and then register the Japanese at uh, the time is uh, the right thing. It's a universally right, exactly uh, same yeah. as a uh, French register uh, German uh, at uh, the uh. time. Is uh, as you know, it's a uh, at the time is a uh, Japan and German is uh, allied and. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the not German Nazis occupy the French yeah, and right. Japan occupy the, the Koreans. Yeah. So nowadays uh, we nobody think about the uh, French regist as a terrorist. Uh -huh. This is yeah. the Korean say it's right. the thing the same. It's the right. is not terrorist. Right. Right. But it's the do you think any kind of the possibly substantial substantially difference is it's uh, the French occupying Japan? I uh, French the German occupying the French and Japanese occupying Korean at the time's condition, or uh, in other words, is uh, mm. any room to interpret An Jung Gun as a terrorist? I'm not sure I understood uh, all so of the question. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's uh, any substantial differences mm -hmm. is uh, the Nazi occupying mm -hmm. France. Mm -hmm and Japan uh, occupying Korea. Uh, okay, I think I understand. So are you asking, um, and I want to first of all make clear that, um, that I'm not calling An Jung Un a terrorist. <laughs> so I hope that's clear, right? Um, but you're asking um, why, for example, the Japanese 
politician could come out and call Ahn Jung-un a terrorist when you wouldn't have someone in Germany today calling a, a French resistor a terrorist? Is that, is that sort of? No, it's that uh, not much concern about uh, the Japanese politician. That's a politician. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a, as a historian, uh -huh, it's uh, uh -huh. one new opinion and yeah. any substantial differences. B and between the two yeah, and, uh, occupations? Actually, what is doing uh -huh. the Ahn Jung-un as, as a history, it's yeah. Yeah. what you learn and any differences and French less resistant and uh, uh -huh. Ahn jung is uh, doing. Well, um, if the question is about sort of comparing the Nazi occupation of France to Japan's colonial rule in Korea? Is that sort of more what you're wondering about? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that um, there's no doubt. I mean, just if you think about uh, the stretch of time, what the Nazis were in, Korea, in, in France for five years, as opposed to 35 years, and, and of course the, the decades of sort of, you know, the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War and um, the complexities of that. And um, so the, um, just the kind of, maybe the, the difference has to do with the, the length of the memory, right? That Koreans, uh, both in North and South, have so much more memory of Japan's colonial rule, the, the brutality, the, the violence that the Japanese uh, perpetrated during the time that they were in power there. Um, of course, the Nazis, plenty of brutality on their side too, but there's just no sort of comparison when you think about um, the experience of the Korean people compared to that of the French. That would be my, my answer. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, Steve. Um, Thanks, uh, great talk tonight, I really appreciate it. Um, I've been thinking as you're talking about the politics of memory uh -huh. and how, s how subtle but deep and important it is. Mm. Um, and contrasting that to post-1980 mm. electoral politics, politics in the United States, mm. Mm. which have increasingly been defined as wedge politics. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and I would characterize them as the politics of fantasy and pejorative characterization. Mm, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I like that. Get, uh, where, mm. where are we mm. moving forward? I mean, Christopher Hill gives us a very reasoned view of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you and our other historians are kind of hopeful, but how equipped are we with this kind of insane, and I'm not talking about Trump, mm -hmm. mind yeah. you, but, but an entire move mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. electoral policy. How equipped are we as a nation to deal in a leadership role with those kinds of subtleties <laughs> today, uh, given those electoral politics? Well, um, so let me make sure I understand. So are you, are you asking about sort of, it sounds like you're suggesting that um, here in the United States, we have plenty of our own problems with these kinds of you know, politicization of the past and the distortions that we see. And, and are you asking if sort of, in that context, what chance do we have of kind of playing a, an informed and help constructive role in East Asia? Is that, yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are asking some hard questions tonight. <laughs> um, no, um, well, what I would say is, I mean, I was, and I'm super grateful to the organizers of the lecture series for bringing Christopher Hill here. It was a great honor uh, for me to have a chance to meet him while he was here and, um, and to hear some of his experience. And what that really solidified for me, and, and you know, I'm constantly listening to or, uh, interviews and, and, and reading about the, um, the perspectives of the seasoned diplomats, the, the career people at the Department of State or the other, you know, and, and a lot of, I think, really constructive work, and this has kind of been a theme that I've been trying to hit on. A lot of times, this is my personal pet peeve, I, for all of the kind of New York Times headlines I was happy to splash up here, um, I get really frustrated with the way our media covers East Asia because we, we are so preoccupied with, I mean, you were talking about, he's a politician, we shouldn't care about him, and I think that's true, right? Um, our politicians and our politician right now <laughs> are showing themselves to be, I mean, the, the worst 
they're the avatars of this kind of wedge politics that you're talking about, and they are not helping. <laughs> Right. I mean, this. I mean, the sort of debacle in Hanoi the other day. That's a perfect example. That approach. I'm just gonna wing it. I'm gonna feel my way through this. That is not going to work, right? And um, and so that's why I feel a, a kind of uh, I'm just tearing my hair out about th those kinds of developments taking place at the higher levels. But um, I'm. I guess if I'm hopeful, it's because I think that at the um, the more kind of personal level of interaction, um, I see a lot more willingness uh, to have open conversations. Um, for example, so you were asking about Nanjing, right? It's not in a, a Japan and South Korea are liberal democratic societies. They're not perfect, but you don't get thrown in jail for talking about the rape of Nanjing or for acknowledging the brutality of Japan's colonial rule in Korea or in Taiwan, right? Um, and similarly, I think that there are plenty of um, career diplomats and private citizens here in the United States. I, I know I've had plenty of them come through my classroom, right? I've been inspired by the openness of, that I see in the, the young generation to really um, grapple with these issues, to sort of sit with the ambiguities and the complexity. Um, so I think that honestly, if maybe we, we were able to see past the sort of the spotlight of the what's going on among our politicians sometimes and, and have a, a more sort of systemic view of the kind of personal interactions that are happening every day, um, that there's a lot more reason to be optimistic. But I don't know. That's, a, that's about as cheery as I can get. One of the concerns that I have mm -hmm. is, and, I, and you may not be able to address this, mm -hmm. but I've learned a lot tonight that I did not learn in the history courses that I took, mm. you know, in my college career. I'm shocked. <laughs> our diplomatic corps, our ambassadors, mm -hmm. are they taking the time mm. to understand mm -hmm. wh whatever country they may be yeah. or whatever area they mm -hmm. may be dealing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. to um, the memory politics as yeah. you described yeah. it tonight? Yeah. Uh, do you have any feel for that, whether that kind of training mm. is very <laughs> rigorously going on? Well, you know, you, you, you talk to any academic and he or she will tell you, well, if they only would take my discipline seriously. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, I was talking to Christopher Hill ab about this actually. And I mean, I was, uh, I don't think he was just trying to puff me up. He asked me for some recommendations about books on Japanese history. Um, and I was just, I was so impressed by his interest, you know, um, in learning about the history of Japan and East Asia, um, is a uh, deep knowledge of the history of East Asia a sort of requirement for getting into the foreign service in the United States? I would say probably not. There are plenty of other tracks that people can take to, to get there. But, um, but again, just from my own limited experience in higher ed, I know that the, the the sort of general profile of the students who are inspired and serious about trying to change the world in that sort of context, foreign service or some sort of government role or even at the kind of NGO level or something like that, um, they're coming to take my classes because they're interested and they want to know. And, um, and those sort of career diplomats who are being you know, held in disdain by our current administration, they're out there, you know, and they have that perspective. So I, I wish that, um, you know, it just, it makes me cringe when I hear about sort of, um, you know, our embassies around the world that don't have the staff because they just haven't been making the appointments, right? So we're in a period right now when that sort of valuable knowledge and, and those kinds of perspectives are, are being sort of, um, Withheld or or diminished and, and silenced in various ways, but they're there and they're, and they'll they'll make a comeback. I think a lot of those people are kind of retreating into other venues right now, but I think there'll be a change and and they'll come back. I like to think. Uh, hi, yeah. uh, I would like to thank you a lot yeah. for coming to give this talk and Thanks. also for focusing on the politics of memory, which seems to be a theme that's run through um, the speakers before you as oh well. Yeah. We've learned about not only things like the French that you brought up, mm. the visit that Abe had, but mm. also 
different um, aspects of Japanese and Korean relations when it comes to memory. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you, uh, like, as a historian mm. or even from a cultural perspective, mm. what do you think are some factors that contribute to the pervasiveness of the politics of memory when it mm. comes to East Asia? Mm. And why, why do they have so much sway? Uh. Um, I mean, uh, I think one of the previous speakers uh, kind of touched on the idea that South Korean, uh, that South Korean, like Japanese imperialism is definitely an unresolved issue, mm -hmm, but yeah. what do you think are um, some historical or cultural mm -hmm. reasons mm -hmm. that contribute to the importance? And that's such a great and rich question. I mean, there's so much that you could say about that. I mean, honestly, I think um, someone should write a book about that, <laughs> actually. Um, one thing I'll say, and I touched on this before, um, that the United States has a lot of responsibility for that problem, right? That um, in the 1950s and 1960s, when the United States was working hard to sort of bring Japan uh, sort of back into the international community as its strategic ally in terms of the policy of containment and the Cold War. Um, the United States actively worked to discourage open conversation about the history because, because it was so divisive. You know, I mean, it's remarkable. When you look in the 1950s, Mao Zedong, of all people, was pretty um, happy to meet with the Japanese. They, they were making sort of informal economic uh, agreements in the 1950s. There was a lot of sort of um, engagement, and that was not part of the American plan <laughs> for the Cold War, right? Um, and so uh, you look into the history of sort of America's Cold War uh, involvement in East Asia, and for complicated reasons that I'm not even sure I fully understand yet, in terms of the, the nitty gritty details, um, we did a lot to prevent the Japanese and the South Koreans from having the kinds of conversations that they could have, right? And, the, and similarly uh, with Japan and, and China, right? So I mean, I think that that's part of the answer. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think that there's a a relatively small sector of Japanese society, these kind of right-wing nationalists that Abe loves to pander to, who um, keep the issue alive, right? Because they keep doing these incredibly provocative things, right? If you go to Japan these days, um, and this has been true since the first time I went there in 1998, you go to any big city, um, and especially if you go around any kind of, um, you know, g government buildings, you're, you won't be surprised to see these black vans driving around. They're these black vans that have these big loudspeakers, and they just drive around just spouting the most offensive stuff about, you know, uh, denying Japanese aggression and just kind of pretending that these things didn't happen. Um, or and, and, and much worse, right? And so they sort of continue to uh, undermine, you know, it, like I said, two steps forward, practically two steps back, because you have the Kono statement in 1993, it seems like they're going to turn a corner. You have the Asian Women's Fund in 1995, uh, and then they blow it. They just keep blowing it and again and again. And the Abe administration is uh, just notorious for doing these kind of things. So I don't know. It's just... Um, you know, kind of incompetence and, and foolishness in a, in a small sector of people who have the public's eye, unfortunately. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for it, but those would be two things that I would say. Steve, it's just the, the witching hour. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it.